to play in the jazz style and truly learn to improvise, you have to learn how to transcribe. Today we're going to talk about what that is, why we do it, and how to do it, and even have a little built-in mini workshop to get you started. So grab your horn, I'll wait. Got it? Let's go. Hi, and welcome to the Saxophone Academy. I'm Dr. Wally Wallace, and if you're interested in saxophone masterclasses, please do subscribe and be sure to hit the like button. My fragile ego needs it. Now today, before we begin, I have to say a big thank you to the Saxophone Academy members. Many of you reached out and bought me a coffee last week. It really means a lot to me. I was very humbled and grateful for your support. It helps me keep videos like this free and clears a little bit of my plate to make more videos like this. So truly, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Now today we're gonna to talk about learning jazz style and building a jazz vocabulary through transcription. Now transcribe literally means to write down, but in learning jazz, we're gonna define it as listening to some or all of a solo, learning it by ear and learning to play along with the recording. Now we're gonna talk about what we do, how we do it, why we do it, and I've got a little built-in workshop at the end of the video to get you started doing it. So first things first, why do we need to transcribe? Why do we need to listen to solos and play along with them? Well, you simply cannot learn the jazz language by reading sheet music. We've talked in previous videos about articulation rules, where to start and stop a note, how to swing bebop style, and we'll cover more of these concepts in future videos as well. You simply cannot learn it all alone by reading sheet music or listening to verbal instructions. If all you're doing is learning jazz licks off a sheet of paper, you're never gonna truly be convincing and learn the style, certainly not developing a language of your own to have your own voice one day. Now, how does it work? Why does it work? Well, let's start by talking about foreign language. When I was in graduate school, I took a semester of French. Don't ask why. And I was a decent student. I always read the books, did the written assignments, but I never went to the language lab and did the listening assignments or talked to French speakers like we were supposed to. It was all fine and good until the end of the semester, I had a 10 minute oral examination with the teacher one-on-one. -on -one. I walked into her office and started the conversation with parlez vous anglais. It didn't go well. She looked rather disappointed and I barely passed the class and I had to promise her that I would never try to speak French again. I didn't keep my word. Now, interestingly enough, the next year, I actually spent a couple weeks in France at the Vienne Jazz Festival in Vienne, France. And after being surrounded by native French speakers for about a week, all of a sudden I was like, Je voudrais un café. Bon. Bon. And by the end of that trip, if someone tried to speak to me in French, I could very easily reply, Je ne parle pas français. Désolé. Just like learning a foreign language, reading the rules and seeing it on paper is not enough. You have to be surrounded by native speakers. In the world of jazz, that's jazz players and records. Listening and playing along, conversing in a sense, with actual jazz recordings. The style is just too nuanced, there's too much detail that can never be translated into the English language, or certainly not onto paper. So even if you learn a huge vocabulary of jazz licks through books, and you can buy these PDFs all over the place for 30 bucks, 101 jazz licks, even if you learn them, it will never be convincing, it will never be your voice because you're learning it out of context. You have to speak with the native speakers. All right, you're thinking, Dr. Wally, I'm on board, enough with the jibba jabba. How do we do it? Well, a four-step process. Number one, pick a solo and listen. Number two, learn the solo by ear. Number three, play along with the recording. And number four, play it by yourself with a metronome. Let's go over each of these steps with a little bit more detail. Number one, we have to pick a solo. And here we have a little bit of a balancing act. You need to pick something you love, but also something you can approach. And it isn't gonna be too difficult if you're just starting the process. It's important to pick a player you really love because you're gonna be spending a lot of time listening to it. So don't listen to what other people say you should transcribe. You gotta pick something you love that's gonna challenge you, sure, but more importantly, you're gonna step into their shoes and learn the language of that player. When I was in jazz school, players would tell me, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. Well, I really loved Paul Desmond. I mean, I still do. I actually wanted to name my firstborn son, Paul Desmond. My wife said, you mean like first name Paul, middle name Desmond? I said, no. Full name, Paul Desmond. She said, that doesn't make sense. I said, you don't make sense. We compromised and went with her name. But I love Paul Desmond, so I transcribed 
Paul Desmond. Sure, I do plenty of other players, but it's okay to pick someone that may not be the hippest player with your jazz school friends, but someone whose language you really want to learn. Pick something that's gonna challenge you, but not make you wanna quit. And if you're not sure where to start, Lou Donaldson is a great place to start on alto. I start my students on his tune, Blues Walk. It's a minor blues, beautiful, not too hard to start with. And for tenor players, I really like to start with Hank Mobley, Dig Dis, off the album Soul Station. Great album, they're good starting places. Now, once you've picked your transcription, the next step is to listen constantly, all the time. So once you've picked a solo, you've got to start listening. That's the most important step, listening constantly. When I was commuting to teach a couple different college jobs in other states, don't ask, the college teaching market is just stupid, I would actually put on a solo on a loop using some software that we'll talk about in just one second and listen to just one chorus of the solo over and over and over while I was in the car commuting to my job. If you're on the bus or jury duty or whatever, just put on the recording on a loop and listen over and over. You wanna listen often enough that it becomes stuck in your subconscious mind where you can actually sing along. That's gonna make the transcription process much more valuable and much easier as well. Step number two, start learning the solo by ear. Many of these solos you can find in transcription books or PDFs you can buy. Don't do that, certainly not yet. You can check yourself later, but start by learning by ear. If you're just reading it out of a book, that's like paying someone else to do your push-ups. You're not gonna get any benefit, or at least not the big rewards, like doing your own push-ups. I pay a guy named Gene to do my push-ups, and he's got like rotator cuff issues, so you can't really hire him. He's about to give up the industry altogether. You've got to do the heavy lifting yourself, small bite-sized chunks, which leads to the obvious question. Can I slow it down? Can I use software? Yes, yes, no question, yes. Occasionally on saxophone forums, someone will ask the question, I'm transcribing, can I slow it down? Can I use software? And some hotshot will say, no, you gotta do it at full tempo off the record like the old cats back in the day or when I was in jazz school. But look, you may not be in jazz school paying $80,000 a year to practice six hours a day. If you have time, super duper. If you've got the ears to do it at full speed, great. But I'm here to tell you, my name is Dr. Wally, and I use software to slow down my transcriptions. There's a couple of really good options. I love a program called Transcribe Plus. I'm not an affiliate, I don't make any money, but I like it because it has a very clean, easy to use interface, slowing down, speeding up. Okay, I honestly never really speed it above normal tempo, and doing loops is super easy. Another popular one is AnyTune, which is on the App Store, I think for both iOS and Android. It's very popular, it does everything just as well. The interface just doesn't connect with me as much. Either option is great. Also, if you're watching videos on our fundamentals course or even on YouTube, you can slow it down using the options. So if you're on a desktop computer, the bot right down here, the little gear icon, click that and you can change the playback speed. If you're on a mobile device, there's three dots, right? Jared, I'm looking at Jared up there, three dots, click that, you can slow it down. There, both work well. What I like about Transcribe and AnyTune, the apps, is you can actually loop very easily and listen over and over and over and over and over. I find that very helpful. So if I try learning a solo the first time without slowing it down. I usually crash and burn. So you can slow it down 10 or 20%. I might still crash and burn, but if I slow it down 50%, well then you might be able to pick up more of the notes and rhythm and articulation. It doesn't matter how much you have to slow it down, you're not trying to impress anyone, you're trying to learn an art form. Don't worry about the Instagram bros or what they think you should be doing. Have fun and do what you need to do to learn it successfully. Step number three, once you've learned at least a chorus of the material, it's time to play along at tempo with your favorite artist. And a chorus, if you don't know, is just one time through the chord changes, the song form. And if I ever use a word you're not familiar with, be sure to ask in the comments. There's no shame for not understanding any of the terms I use. When I was in grad school, I was in a big band rehearsal, and I remember asking a question about a certain chord, and the jazz professor kind of scoffed and said, you didn't know that? And the other players in the big band looked at me like, yeah, man, you don't know that? And I said very confidently, if I already knew everything, I wouldn't be paying you. So answer my question. And after thinking for a bit, I think he got the point. 
Never be ashamed of not knowing a term. Make sure you ask me in the comments below. So once you have a course or one time through the changes learned, start to speed it back up and play along with the recording. And what we're aiming for is stepping into the shoes of that player where you can't tell where they end and you begin. You really kind of adopt exactly the way they phrase and play, even mimic their tone. It doesn't have to be your ideal tone, but learning to play like that will help you develop your own voice. We'll talk about that in a future video. Step number four, once you can play with the recording, make sure you can do it without the recording and just a metronome. If you can do it on two and four, that's great. If you need to do it four beats, that's fine as well. But you wanna make sure you're doing it solo so then you can really hear the articulations, the accents, your tone, and everything else, the, those little details that get covered up by the recording. Playing along with the recording alone can kind of hide a couple of problem areas. Doing it with just the metronome kind of shines a spotlight on anything wrong with your playing, which is good to know, then we can fix it. All right, enough talk. Get out your horn, it's time to play. And if you're on the bus or it's midnight and your kids are sleeping, I don't care, I said get out your horn. Or at least bookmark this and do it later on when you have time. Now today's workshop is just two choruses of a simple concert F blues. That's D on alto or G on tenor. And it's taken from this month's blues etude for April in the free fundamentals course. I'll put a link down below. You can also download the sheet music after you've learned it by ear. I want you to learn it by ear first, then you can check yourself with the sheet music. So the first chorus is a little bit easier. Start there and use that little gear icon or the three dots and slow it down. Take it measure by measure, learn it, and then play along with Dr. Wally. Now, chorus number two is a little bit more challenging. Same thing, slow it down and learn it by ear. You'll find a few more eighth note running lines and a little bit of chromatic alteration to make it a little bit more spicy. Challenge your ears. Learn this chorus as well by ear. And it may take you an hour or more to get each course learned by ear. That's absolutely fine. It's not a race. We're training our ears, and more importantly, to hear something in our mind translated to our fingers. It's a long, slow process. I still do it every week that I practice. Most great players I know are still learning recordings by ear. It's a great way to do it. You're going to have questions. Let me know in the comments below. Then also be sure you download the sheet music after you've learned it by ear to check yourself. Next couple of weeks, we're gonna dive much more into truly improvising on the saxophone. We're gonna talk about jazz scales, the blues scale, and some other cool techniques you can use to start building your own melodic content. I will see you very soon, probably next week. And until then, go practice.